Hi, today we're at Elkborough Flats, which is North Lincolnshire. It's the Humber Estuary, and at the moment it's one of the better places in the UK to be photographing bearded reedlings or bearded tits. And they're very numerous here. There's one main drag, comes from the car park right through the marshes, and they're on both sides of the track, mainly for the first 300 metres or so. And it's been very productive. Yesterday, which was Saturday, there's about 20 people here, half a dozen photographers. Today, there's only been one other photographer here. But it's very good, they're very numerous, very tame, approachable birds. No problem getting close to them. It's just that they're hidden in the reeds a lot. It's a common sight in the autumn to see bearded reedlings taking grit. They swallow it into their gut where it helps to grind up the seeds that they start to feed on at this time of year. During the summer months, they're going to be insect feeders, but they turn to seeds in the winter. This is a very common pose for a bearded reedling. They've got a foot on each of these stems and they're spread eagle between them. You see a lot of photographs taken of bearded reedlings like this. They're much easier to photograph when it's not a windy day. They don't go so high up the stems when it's windy because they're blowing about too much. It's really, from a photography point of view, a, a good weather bird. This is a very typical shot. The male is a very striking bird with that black moustache. Now because I'm photographing a bird in a reed bed, I've swapped to one single focusing point only. Then I can put that single focusing point onto the bird, telling it where the bird is, the subject that I'm interested in. It's a bit unfair to expect the bird recognition system to work when the bird is obscured by reeds going across the front of it. It can't recognise that shape. So this is one of the few situations where I do swap to a single focusing point. Photographers often say they are easier to photograph in the autumn. This is the time when they're climbing up the reed stems. I don't really know because I haven't got a colony of bearded reedlings close to me. This is the female. When this bird landed on a fence I almost didn't take the picture but quickly I realised I should and I took it and the reason this is a valuable picture to me is I can get a cut out from this. I can cut all the background away and just leave the bird with a white background and commercially that's a successful thing to do and I have thousands of pictures of birds which are just cut outs and they sell quite well. This is what I mean by a cut out. This is a fallow deer followed by a gento penguin and why they sell so well, I don't know. Although the day started off very clear, by about 10 o'clock it started to fog over. You could see the fog rolling in across the reed beds and it was affecting the photography. You could see the, the mistiness around the bird. The only way I could continue to photograph was to get closer to the birds. The less distance between you and the bird, the less that fog is going to interfere. It is one of our more beautiful birds. Since I was in the area, I crossed over the River Humber and went to Stone Creek, which has been one of the best locations this year for photographing short-eared owls. It's a huge area and there's a lot of owls there. Unfortunately, they never really came as close as I would like them to. I really need to find my own short-eared owls on a private site where I can put a hide up and photograph them. Then they're going to come as close as I want them to come. Short-eared owls are very prone to interacting with one another. 
they often fly towards each other and have a, a confrontation very briefly. And at this particular site, hen harriers were being seen on a regular basis. And I was lucky that the, the hen harrier did come close enough to photograph. I'll just do a bit of a coming shortly on films I'm working on at the moment. I've got hold of a Lumix G9 Mark II, so I've been comparing that against my OM-1 camera. And hopefully in a couple of weeks' time I'll get a YouTube film out on that subject. I'm not going to do a review of the G9 Mark II, there's lots of those on YouTube already, done much better than I'm ever going to do it. I'm going to do it from the point of view of comparing it against the OM-1 from a wildlife photography angle. It's not an easy thing to do, the differences are often quite subtle. But I can tell you this, when you're comparing cameras like this, usually each of them has its advantage and disadvantage. And that's certainly the case here. There are certain situations where I'd only want to use the OM-1, but there's another situation where the G9 Mark II is absolutely outstanding. These next two clips are both taken with the G9 Mark II, and it was a session I really enjoyed doing. I think for video, the G9 Mark II is an exceptional camera, way beyond anything that I've owned before. But next week's film is going to be a little different. I've mentioned before that my car was stolen and I lost some equipment in there. Not cameras or lenses, but two tripods, a bird hide, binoculars. Well, one month after the car was stolen, I found my big tripod with the wonderful Miller head for sale on eBay. But what do you do when you find your stolen property for sale on eBay? There's no easy answer to it, but next week I'll show you what happened. Thanks for watching.